We know everybody is so busy these days. Um, I did hear we're already being recorded. I want everybody to, who's participating to understand that we're recording this entire session and then it'll be posted on our district website for those who would like to review or, you know, let somebody else know that they can come and listen to this. Um, we do have a translator for our Spanish speaking families. Love to introduce uh, Maria Torres. Maria, can you say hi? Este, este foro va a estar siendo traducido. Bienvenidos a todos. Pueden escoger uh, traducción presionando el globo terráqueo que en unos momentos va a aparecer en su pantalla en la parte inferior. Pueden seleccionar español. Thank you. And then one more thing before we, um, before we have our Spanish speaking parents work with you um, in particular. I wanted to let everybody know that this is a um, a forum for student support services in San Luis Coastal. So we're specifically talking about special education and special education services during distance learning um, during this forum. So I just wanted to make sure that you were um, in the right place. If you are a Spanish speaker, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see a globe that you can click which will immediately get you to work with our translator, Maria Torres. Para asegurarnos de que están en el foro correcto, el día de hoy vamos a estar hablando acerca de servicios de soporte, específicamente de educación especial. Um, así que una vez más, si necesitan servicios de interpretación o traducción, um, por favor, ahora que aparezca en su pantalla un pequeño globo terráqueo, lo presionan y luego presionan español. Okay, and just for um, the fact that we're being translated today, we will take periodic pauses. We want to make sure that our Spanish speaking families are able to um, catch up with any translations and understand the um, process of our presentation. Uh, Mrs. Hansen is going to share screen. We do have a presentation that we'd like to um, go through with all of our families and then um, an open opportunity to ask questions. So Joyce, if you don't mind sharing screen. I will as soon as I'm allowed. Oh, there we go. All right, very good. So um, my name is Diane Frost. I'm the Executive Director of Student Support Services and I'm here with Joyce Hansen and she's the Coordinator of Special Education. And together we'd like to um, share with you some details about special education and services and answer your questions during this very, very crazy time of COVID pandemic and distance mm -hmm. learning. Uh, just wanted to go a little bit over the agenda that we have for today. We, um, we've already kind of talked about tech tips a bit. Everybody is muted. Uh, when we get to the open questions part of the presentation, we'll show you how to ask questions and Mandy and Luana will help us out with that. Our plan is to talk a little bit about the background, how we got where we are, talk about new legislation, that is affecting special education during distance learning. A little bit about a waiver, and I think most people are aware of waivers that are available for um, some grade level children to come back to schools in some cases. Talk a little bit about our ESY uh, program, distance learning, virtual learning, assessments, and then we'll get to our um, question and answer opportunity. So let's start a little bit um, of background. And just I'm reminding you of what you might already know. We closed down on March 16th. So Friday, March 13th, the district made the decision. It was a very difficult decision to close schools, but we did have to do that, as did throughout our county and eventually throughout the state. On June 29th, Governor Newsom signed Senate Bill 98 the Education Omnibus Trailer Bill, which promoted in-person learning in the fall while 
also authorizing distance, distance learning and providing guidelines for implementation. So that was on the 29th. On the 16th, looking at everything that was going on in our county, our Board of Education, after much input from staff and from the community, approved Plan C, which is distance learning for San Luis Coastal students. And what they also said was they believed that small groups of at-risk kids should be able to come back for instruction. So that was part of their thinking on July 16th. Literally one day later on July 17th, Governor Newsom announced that all districts on the watch list must begin school in distance learning. And what probably everybody on this Zoom knows is San Luis Obispo County is on the watch list. We have enough active cases of COVID-19 in our county that we are on the watch list, so we are required to begin in distance learning. All right, Joyce, I think you're gonna talk a little bit about the next slide. I am. So um, Senate Bill 98, as Diane mentioned, um, was passed at the end of June and Gavin Newsom signed it into law. And it, what it does is it authorizes distance learning for schools as an option for schools for this school year. It, it does have requirements about daily live interaction. It has requirements about attendance taking and progress monitoring and maintaining connections with school. And then it also does clearly state that special education related services um, and any um, services that are required for a pupil's IEP with accommodations that are necessary for distance learning would be executed. So, um, and moving, sorry. And then there's also a new requirement that um, the Senate bill um, adds to the ed code for, um, I'm sorry, I'm, yeah, I didn't switch slides for you. Um, a new requirement that the Senate bill adds that IEPs must now include what's called an emergency plan. This is not the same as the distance learning plan. Um, but there is going to be added in IEP meetings that you'll be seeing throughout the school year, um, a statement of an emergency plan. So discussing the means that the IEP would be implemented in emergency conditions of more than 10 days. Um, and there's also a requirement that we are documenting daily participation for each pupil um, for distance learning times. Very good, then going on to the next slide. All right, let's talk a little bit about the waiver process. And it may be that you're aware of this through media, through our local newspapers. The um, California Department of Public Health does allow waivers so that schools can bring some children back. Right now, that waiver allows TK through sixth grade programs. Secondary waivers have not been approved, nor have waivers for special education kids outside of TK through sixth grade. You'll see that we um, put a link in to the waiver for our families who might want to just link in there and see um, the process of a school district to fill out a waiver. It's really quite a complicated process. That said, San Luis Coastal is committed to completing waivers for small group instruction for at-risk TK through sixth grade. So Joyce, if you'd go to the next slide. So it really is a um, complicated process and it requires us to um, have the input of parents, staff, and the community. We've actually already begun our conversations with our staff, really looking at what that would take to bring staff back who would be interested in coming back to work um, in these circumstances on our campuses. Um, we are, as I said earlier, really committed to the at-risk vulnerable students first. Um, as conditions allow, we even see ourselves um, expanding on that. So if you see the most vulnerable group of special education children, getting those kids on campus um, with our protective and sanitation 
um, and the correct number of kids in a classroom at a single time, and then branching out from there after we ensure safety, ensure health. Um, so we do see starting with small groups and expanding out while always, always considering the health and safety of our staff, students, and families. One of the things that is a hurdle for us in the waiver process currently is the number of active cases in San Luis Obispo County. The California Department of Public Health really does set a limit. They'd like to see no more than 200 active cases per 100,000 population in a county to allow us to um, put in a waiver. Right now, San Luis County is far over 200. Um, our data from August 11th, we had roughly around 589 cases. So we're well over the 200. That said, San Luis Coastal is still meeting and we are still putting together the waivers so that we are ready for the day and time that the California Department of Public Health is ready to accept our waivers. We also continue to work with county officials. We continue to work with our own legal counsel to define what is allowable. So understand that this is something that we have our finger on the pulse of. It's our interest. And I think if you, um, Joyce, go to the next slide, I think I can uh, show you there. Um, San Luis Coastal, I think, has already proven its intent to bring kids back to campus. We had an in person ESY this summer, and ESY is extended school year. So we have a number of special education children who qualify for this extended service. San Luis Coastal, unlike districts throughout the state, offered in-person ESY. We had 72 students attend in person. We had 13 kiddos who decided that distance learning was best for them. So for those 72 in person, we had 12 teachers, 47 paras, and we were able to do this for four full weeks. And this was uh, kind of following a plan we put in and was approved through the um, San Luis Obispo um, Department of Public Health. And it was very detailed. Our personal protection, our sanitation, the number of children, the social distancing, um, temperature taking, all of that was very, very highly planned and we implemented this summer. We did have to close down the last week. We got in 16 days and then when we found ourselves on the watch list, felt in, a, in an abundance of caution. And again, always looking at the health and safety of our staff and students, we decided to do the last four days virtually. But again, even though San Luis Obispo finds itself in a, with a number of cases that currently today precludes us from putting in a waiver, we continue to work on that waiver, we continue to work with the county, and we continue to plan for the time that we can bring our kids back. All right, next slide. Okay. So as we're planning for that time, we are planning um, distance learning at this point in time also. And earlier this week, the district-wide DLP went out to families and that kind of gave a global picture of what distance learning is going to look like in the district, including some sample schedules that went along with that. Our teachers and case managers and service providers are working on developing individualized distance learning plans for each of their student, each of our students with an IEP and those will be sent out next week. So our case managers in there will be looking to provide um, a robust individual um, distance learning plan with services as close to the IEP services as they are written as possible and um, managers will be contacting parents to discuss the, the individual, IEL, individual DLP and get input from them. And it'll be a constant ongoing communication piece. As I said earlier, one of the requirements of Senate Bill 98 is that we're tracking 
you know, keeping track of contacts and then making sure that we're reaching out and making those contacts and that and part of that tracking will be contacting parents and checking in with parents on how things are going with the distance learning um, plan. Oh, and I also, sorry, I wanted to also add that your case managers will be reaching out to um, parents of students with IEP this week or next early next week to determine if parents are okay with the distance learning plan, individualized distance learning plan being sent to you via email um, and we'll be mailing them out, but you'll get it a little bit quicker if we can send it to you through email. So your case managers will be reaching out to confirm that that's okay. And then I wanted to talk about the work of our paraeducators. So last spring, our paraeducators were reaching out and connecting with students. We expanded on that a little bit more with ESY and what they were doing because we did have um, kind of a hybrid program for ESY. We had, while we had students in person and we're committed to that, we had families that felt like it was better for them or their child to um, continue in a distance learning format. And so we did a hybrid program in ESY where some of our paraeducators were helping to facilitate connections with students that were connecting with the classroom virtually. So they were connecting with our in-person classroom virtually. So our one-to-one -one paraeducator is absolutely going to, you know, their first priority is going to be creating, you know, working with the teacher to create specialized lessons, individualized supports for task completion, and then modifying and adapting any assignments and classes, um, classwork for students um, that they are assigned to. The classroom paraeducators that, are, that serve our uh, students in our resource programs and our special day classes support the entire classroom. And they'll be, again, virtually, but working with small groups of students, um, doing daily check-in and check-outs, doing some reteaching, doing follow-up um, lessons and small group you know, sessions with students as a follow-up to what the teachers are doing and working closely with the teachers. And so all of our paraeducators are helping our students um, with class sessions. They, um, during a class session, they may have an open, doc, open Google Doc with the students so that while the student's listening to instruction, they're taking notes and sending messages to the student and they're going back and forth that way. Um, creating videos to teach or reinforce learnings, um, cashing out students that have behavior plans, helping students with organization and maintaining their daily schedule and making sure that they know where they need to be and what assignments need to be turned in. Doing those virtual check-ins, they could be reading a book with a student, listening to the student read, they can be playing a game with the student, and also just connecting and providing support as needed for students. All right, a little bit about, or maybe, is that still you, Joyce? Sorry. It is still me. There we go. <laughs> um, okay, so um, modifications and accommodations. So all teachers, all teachers across the district are going to be trained next week on supporting students with modifications and accommodations um, in gen ed, in special ed, and what that looks like in distance learning. So our program specialists are working on finding resources and tools and tips and strategies that you know, people have found that have been effective for, to support distance learning and supporting those modifications and accommodations. And really also zeroing <coughs> in on those modifications and accommodations and saying, you know, okay, what is this going to look like in a distance format? versus what it would look like in my in a regular classroom. Um, and all modifications and accommodations in the current IEP will be implemented to the extent feasible in distance learning. And if you're feeling like the modifications and accommodations are not being implemented, or if you have any questions or concerns about the modifications and accommodations for your student, please check in with your IEP managers and, and have a conversation with them. They are kind of your go-to first line person for questions. Very good. And then um, I wanted to remind the group that um, special education students, just like general education students, have the option for a virtual learning program instead of a distance learning program. Um, for our elementary students, if you're an RS level student, you're assigned to a general education VLP teacher, and then you'll have a VLP IEP manager. For children who have a little bit more um, intensive supports through our SDC classes, we are actually having those children stay with their SDC teacher 
but they will participate in that class through the virtual learning program. We think there are so many benefits for them to stay with their current IEP manager and current um, peers in the class. It just made a lot of sense for us. Our secondary students will do their special education courses through distance learning and then APEX courses, just like their general education peers in um, the VLP program do. So, all right, Joyce, next slide. And then finally, assessments. Um, San Luis Coastal is committed to um, beginning to complete the triennial assessments and the initial assessments. This will definitely take um, consultation with the local public health officials. Um, assessments are done best in person. Our assessors have to have you know, contact with the kiddos, um, watch them as they're um, completing their work, observe them, um, and the in-person just gives us so much more in information that's helpful in designing program. So we're um, putting together a process right now. We hope that our local public health department approves this process, but that will allow us to continue triennial assessments and then begin our initial assessments. And we really consider beginning our initial assessments critical. We do not want children out there needing services, and we don't know that. So um, for our families who have open initial assessments, they will be contacted by um, the district very soon. And then we'll talk through what our um, safety procedures are after they're um, approved by the um, public health department. Just know that, that is, um, that's a, a, a priority of student services. All right, uh, Joyce and I hoped to go through a couple of um, common questions. We're happy to say that we have um, families with children with IEPs throughout the district who email us or call us with questions and for anybody in this Zoom, that's open to you also. But we thought we'd start with just answering some common questions and then open it up to um, the questions that people in the Zoom might have. So Joyce, if you wanna start with our first one. Okay, so one of the questions that we're getting a lot of is what will services look like in the fall? So our services will follow the general education services also. So we'll be, you know, first and foremost, it will be synchronous instruction for that specialized academic instruction. So just like the general education students, they'll be live online times with the teacher, um, meeting with the teacher in groups and doing you know, class instruction. There'll also be small group instruction. There'll be one-on-one -on -one instruction depending on the needs of the students and what's needed. Related service providers will also be setting up schedules with the student and the family, just like they typically in a normal year would be setting up schedules with the classroom teacher on, on times that work and fit for both the service provider and the family or the, you know, the classroom program. So they'll also be reaching out and setting up services and their services will again match as closely as feasible to the IEP as it is written. Thank you. All right, next question. How does my child get socialization with typical or general education peers in distance learning. Um, our um, children with IEPs have access to their normal general education classes. It's really the reason that we have um, built um, all programs for special education students to match the distance learning program that was built by our instructional supports or our um, ISLA department, instructional services department. Um, we want our children with IEPs to maintain their general education classes. In fact, we consider it critical. Um, we also have children who participate in social skills groups, lunch bunch types of groups, um, handled by speech and language pathologists or resource specialists. All of those will be in place in consultation with the parents. Another question um, that we have been getting is, will my child get the aid services that he or she normally gets with in-person instruction? And again, to the greatest extent possible in a virtual environment, um, a paraeducators and, and, and aids and related services will be available to students. Um, it will be similar to what was offered last spring, but also more robust and more complete in the fall. 
and then goals, um, we will you know, we we will be working with our case managers and our service providers to ensure that we are implementing um, all of the IEP goals that to the maximum extent possible for a virtual in a learning virtual learning environment. We'll be gathering data. We'll be doing progress reports. Um, they may be asking you know you as parents to help with that data gathering or be you know looking at goals in in the home because they're not in a classroom setting where they can get that in observational data from the classroom they'll be gathering it from home setting so how they gather the data may look a little bit different but will they be gathering data and and reporting progress on goals yes they will be and um another question oops sorry Another question is, how do you know if my child progresses on goals? And our IEP managers will be um, monitoring and reporting to parents as usual. And again, it's going to look a little different because of the data collection piece. They're going to have to, you know, it's going to be more kind of anecdotal. It potentially could be more anecdotal or um, observational through the Zoom sessions or Google Meet sessions. And they'll also be relying on their paraeducators. Um, just like we do in a regular um, session year when paraeducators are taking data and reporting that back to teachers for progress monitoring. And I need, think now is the time for open questions. Um, I'm not sure if Mandy or um, Luana can coordinate that for us. I do know that families, if you have questions, um, down at the bottom of your screen, uh, you should be able to click on participants at the bottom and then you can raise a, a blue hand figure, I think. And then that question will be shared with Joyce and I and we will do our best to answer it. All right, so you do have people raising their hands. Very um, good. First up is Thomas Alvarez. Okay. Thomas, you'll need to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, uh, thanks Hello. for having me call. I appreciate it. Um, calling as a parent, uh, not, uh, <laughs> not staff. Um, my question was on the, I didn't see anything or hear anything on the PREPARE program. So I was wondering if anybody can talk a, a bit about that program. So yes, so yeah. our PREPARE program will be opening obviously in a distance learning format. And um, I have actually been working very closely with Tom on finding online resources that would be appropriate for his students and um, we're ordering some online licenses for access for materials and curriculum for him to be working with his students. But again, he will have, you know, similar to the general education minimums at the high school level, he'll be having, he'll be offering services and supports that look similar to that um, for the PREPARE program. And he'll be contacting parents. Yes, he'll uh, be reaching out to parents and you'll be, you'll be getting an individualized DLP from him. Yes. Okay. Tom's one of our teachers who um, worked with us this summer in the mm -hmm. in-person ESY for our prepare po program and just did, as he always does, an amazing job with the community opportunities he provided. And for those parents who don't know PREPARE, it's our adults with disabilities and it's a very, very community-based program. Yeah, and I, I wanted to jump in and add that every time I have talked to Tom in the last couple of weeks, and we're talking every few days, it seems like, but every time I've talked to him, the first thing he says is, so can I be in person yet? So can I be in person? Can I bring him in? So he's, he's very interested and very motivated to, to get back to an in-person session. Dr. Prater. Yes, Diane. Thank you, and Joyce. Thanks. And hi, Mr. Alvarez. How you doing? Hey, how's, how's it going, Dr. Prater? <laughs> good to see you. Thanks for joining us today. I, you brought up a really good question that I just want to um, share with the whole group. That even though right now it's our understanding that the waivers do not apply to students, uh, special education students, or any students above 12 years old. Um, it's my understanding we're pursuing this that there might be um, some potential um, carve out language that allows us to bring back our, um, our adults with disabilities, our medically fragile, and, and students beyond 12 years age, 12 years of age, and, and um, in, in our care um, that would allow us to bring those kiddos back uh, in person which is in so many ways um, 
really important because of learning loss, because of the, um, the impacts that this distance learning program has on our most vulnerable student population. So we are working very intentionally to try and um, bring those programs back as uh, safely and as appropriately as we can. We're um, really having a difficult time seeing the, um, how, how um, the law is working to address that. So we are working on that and I just wanted to let you know. Uh, and just one last question to a follow up to that. Is that when you say bringing them back, is that still being based on the, are you gonna follow the, the 200 cases metric before bringing it back or what would determine you to say, okay, we can, we can bring this back? Yeah, so th those are the questions that we're gonna be asking. So in the board's action on July 16th, the, um, the agreement was plan C the recommendation was plan C, which is distance learning uh, for school in general, with the caveat being for our most vulnerable student populations, that we would try and bring those students back in person. And, um, and so that, that is um, irrespective of that 100 per 100,000 metric that, that I used in my recommendation. However, since then, the governor said, something to the effect that any school district uh, that in a county with 200 or more cases per 100,000, that that would um, uh, prohibit districts from having in-person learning. Now, it's possible that that language, because, of, because there's so many different variables related to infection rates, whether it's the, the um, the prisons, the, the jails, the, the very, you know, nursing homes, the various ways in which we arrive at that data, even the state now is questioning the data that we're, we're having. So I think what's gonna happen, Tom, what's gonna happen is we're gonna have a lot of discussion at the state level and at the county public health level around um, that particular metric, which would allow us um, to um, justify having kids in small groups especially our most vulnerable student populations back in person. And um, that of course requires a lot of cooperation with our, um, our um, teachers association and our classified unions. We have come to an agreement that allows that to be an optional choice and, and we're excited about that. We think we can get um, our teachers, our willing teachers to step in and, and uh, be a part of that. So. Um, we, we have some work to do still to define what that looks like in terms of metrics. And I'm working, in fact, we're uh, meeting with Dr. Bornstein this uh, Friday morning as a county uh, group to discuss this very topic. More information will come. Thank you. All right. right. You yes. have uh, Brecken G. Okay. Am I taking the, there we go. There we go. It's Allison Engel, it's not Breck and Gia. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello, Allison Engel. Hi, I, um, I'm at my brother's house, so a different, day, a different name pops up. But um, so I've got my mama hat on and my teacher hat on. I just have a few questions. Um, one question was, I understand the metric of, of waiting to see if it's 200 people per the 100,000. Um, if we do go back and the number goes back up over 200, do you shut down again? Honestly, I think um, if that happened, we'd be in close contact with the uh, Slow County Department of Public Health and they would guide us. It's very likely that they would um, look at exactly the safety precautions we have in place and maybe what those numbers meant within our own system. Okay. I know there's a couple other people who know um, waivers and cases maybe a little bit better than I, if you want to um, pipe in. Yeah, this is Kim. I would just add um, the documentation currently states that you don't have to automatically shut down. And so I think Diane's exactly right. We would be, um, you know, in talks and consultation, but it, it currently states that you're not required to immediately shut down. Okay. Um, I had another couple questions, sorry. Uh, the other one is, um, 
if a parent has a resource kiddo uh, and they feel that the screen time is too much with the pullout services that are on the IEP, in mm -hmm. addition to the synchronous and the asynchronous teaching, and then the pull-out resource minutes. Um, would we follow the same procedures in if a parent wanted to document that they wanted to pull one or two of those services, mm -hmm. one, would we do the same as if we were in person? Like we would, maybe the language could be that during the COVID and distance learning, but when we return in person, we want that back. Right. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Our parents have not lost the right to call an IEP team meeting. We have to, once a parent says they want one, we um, have to hold it within 30 days and we still maintain that. We are, all, we are still putting together those IEP team meetings. And then Allison, I think, what, um, I, I think it's important what you asked. So the parent feels that it's too much. The parent feels that their child can't do that much screen time. The parent is huge input in our distance learning plans and all of the services that we offer the kids. So we would absolutely hear those concerns. And if as a team we thought we needed to reduce services, we'd do so. For that short period of time, because there's push-in support, right? So in regards yep. to my IEP, there's right. push-in support. I don't mm -hmm. necessarily want that. So it would be, you know, something that I could support at home or during a different time myself. Yes. That's yes. just an example. Um, and then I have one third question, sorry. Uh, the third one is, if the most intensive population of kiddos, um, i.e. the ones I teach, uh, if they go back, are we considering a full day or hybrid? Like, would it be half the kids come back for half day type of deal? Are we going, what are we? You know, we're still working that out, Allison. I'm not sure. Um, best case would be those kiddos came back for a full day and they had their entire instruction. I really think that safety sanitation class size is mm -hmm. going to um, help determine that as well. So it's hard for me to say exactly what that's going to look like today. You might ask me in a week or two and we might have more, um, more information about that. And then I guess I'd say we're always taking input from our parents. So yeah. for parents who actually have some thoughts about that, Mm -hmm. Don't hesitate to email either me or Joyce about that. Okay. Our ESY mm -hmm. program this summer met yeah. ESY hours. Yeah. Right. Because I am hearing, um, I'm hearing that the, maybe the more, more intensive group of kiddos, we're going to start there and then maybe resource kind of fold that in along the way if that becomes a possibility. And if parents maybe don't feel comfortable sending their resource kiddo in for that 30 minute or 60 minute or whatever it is, that's another what we just said in regards to calling an IEP and documenting. Okay. Exactly. All right. Exactly. Okay, perfect. Thank you, you guys. You're welcome. Sorry it came up as Brecken. I knew you wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. All right, nope. thanks, Diane. You got it. All right, next question. Ah. Mandy, do we have any other questions? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, next no worries. Carrie. Okay. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, I was wondering um, about, um, I know some of this will probably be handled within um, an IEP meeting, but uh, my concern is that uh, Zoom meetings, the synchronous video meetings were almost, um, completely um, impossible for my child with the IEP. And so I'm just wondering, um, in the meantime, you know, when we need to be online, what are some ideas in terms of how to have maybe more like, you know, hands-on worksheets and books and things? Um, mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think creatively, but I'm having a hard time thinking about how she can connect with her peers, but not be so um, kind of overstimulated and drained, mm -hmm. you know, by the the online experience. So I would just appreciate hearing, you know, from folks with expertise, because I've been kind of racking my brain uh, to have a better experience um, yeah. in fall versus spring. Mm -hmm. uh, Joyce, do you think you could speak to um, some of the training that our teachers will go through next week mm -hmm. in, the, in the area of synchronous instruction? Yes, so teachers are getting kind of, you know, broad-based um, in 
information about synchronous instruction, but they're also getting a chunk of time spent on looking at how to support students with an IEP or a 504 and what those accommodations and modifications will look like and kind of responding to the individual needs of, you know, okay, this student has these accommodations. What is that going to look like and how is that going to look? And we, you know, we've been having lots of conversations about, you know, in this particular case for this kiddo, staring at a screen is not going to work. We have, they have to have some paper, you know, and, and do some, you know, paper interaction with paper and pencil, and then they can join the, the session or making those Zoom sessions even more interactive so that during that synchronous instruction that's happening, the students are much more active participants. And so they're expected to be writing responses and, you know, raising their hand and asking questions and, you know, and responding to things that, that are going to be instantly put up on the screen. As soon as the student puts in a response, they're going to see, oh, look, there's there's my initial and there's my response or whatever it is. So those are the trainings that the teachers are going to be getting to support that. And then, in, and also time spent thinking about how is this going to impact our students um, with an IEP in their classrooms. But I think you also mentioned the idea of um, talking to the IEP team, and I think that's mm -hmm. going to be critical as well. I mean, there's a, re there's a reason it's called an individual education plan. We want it individual to your child. And if your child has some needs that we can help with in distance learning, whether it's more screen time, less screen time, written out, that kind of thing. We um, want to talk to you about that and make sure that the distance learning plan provides for that. So I really think, good question, thank you. I think a lot of parents might have that question. And I think also it's important to share specifically with your case manager what you noticed in the spring that you're concerned about so that they can come up with a plan to address those concerns now moving forward. Yeah, I think the, um, that, that helps, thank you. Just one quick follow-up is just thinking about the support from the para, we just couldn't really use it because it was only available through um, online. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that also falls under this directive uh, from the state where I'm assuming, you know, para educators can't be even visiting, you know, kids outside. Like I'm assuming it's only via video or phone. But if there were other kind of modes of of support, I would like to kind of hear about that so that I can think about how to brainstorm on that for her IEP. Yeah, right now our paraeducators are not going into homes. When we do have um, staff come back to campuses, it's really the campuses that we're able to control, the PPE, the sanitation, all of that kind of thing. So, but we really are willing to work with our um, families who know their children best about the supports that they need. Like my, the para should contact at this time, or this is what it should look like, or this online platform is better for my kid. We've had some parents say, you know what? I don't want the para on the, um, on the computer. If they could just call my child's cell, and yeah. my child is really comfortable with the cell, and we can work through some things that way. So it's really getting creative, giving our current constraints. Okay, next up we have John Plank. Mr. Plank, how are you? Hello, how are you? Hi, good, how are Hi, you? Okay, thanks. Just trying to wrap my head around all this and how this is mm -hmm. going to work. Um, yep. We have uh, kind of two questions about kind of the same thing, really, um, because, uh, you know, we're two working parents. We both work. We're essentially going to have to place uh, our daughter into the Spark program uh, for a full day uh, while we work full days. And so we can't really guarantee participation in any kind of synchronous educational activities. And she has an IEP. Uh, she was in the ESY over the summer and that seemed to go pretty well. Yeah. Uh, emailed you guys about that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, but typically she's in uh, <clears throat> um, standard education. Uh, so I was wondering what's available for that kind of mode and then, you know, we also considered the option of going just with a purely, you know, distant or remote learning. However, if it comes back to campus, we'd like our daughter to be able to come back to campus. Mm -hmm. so how can mm -hmm. we be able to support, you know, being, you know our, we're going to be able to do maybe an hour in the evening at most. Okay. At, okay. Uh, on, our, on, on our time and, uh, and whatever the, you know, the, the Spark staff can get out of Lauren, but I, suggest, I suspect that's not going to be very much. 
Um, mm -hmm. He gets very, very distracted with devices. And for the most part, there's sees all these 26 keys on the keyboard. And uh, uh, when the Chromebook turns on and she just can't stop pressing them. Yeah. Uh, you know, we yeah. saw that was a big problem in the spring. We spent more time telling her to keep her hands in her lap than mm -hmm. uh, getting her to participate in the uh, virtual activities. I, I'm not familiar with the Spark program that you uh, mentioned. Have they? I think that's what it's called. That's the. Uh, uh, I think that is that what they're calling the uh, the city daycare program that's being held at each of the schools. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Sun fun, so, all day sun and fun. Right. All day sun right. and fun. There might be other people on the Zoom who know a little bit more about that program than I do, um, but I do believe that they are interested in helping our students mm -hmm. stay online with the distance learning yes. through the day that they have them there. So we are committed to providing the technology, the Wi-Fi mm -hmm. if necessary, any right. kind of directions that Lauren might need to implement or whomever the worker is at that program, mm -hmm. we can give seamless directions to help her out. I get what you're saying that um, she may not want to access and that may happen later on at night with you, but anything that we can do to help out with that, to okay. give that staff the directions to work mm -hmm. with your daughter, we can right. definitely do that. In terms of going to VLP with a year long um, commitment, you know, give us a call. Let us know what you're thinking if we end up back in person at some time and you find yourself on um, VLP. Um, right. Anyway, please know that you can do that. I, I do believe that even the general education VLP said space available if we go back in person on a case by case basis you right. could find yourself um, back at your home school and in a class. I feel the same way about special education. We find mm -hmm. ourselves back in classes. You give me a call if that um, works out for Lauren and for you. Right, she, I mean, she models very, very strongly mm -hmm. uh, based on the other behaviors and left right. her own devices. She just mm -hmm. stares at the wall mm -hmm. and fidgets. And, yeah, yeah. Right. And, and you know, having been a, oh, go ahead, Joyce. I just wanted to say that I, you know, I attended, I wasn't able to attend the entire parent forum last week on childcare, but I attended just enough that I did hear um, Megan Berger's presentation on the SPARK program. Right. And it is going to, you know, they are going to be kind of following the academic time frame of um, our distance learning plan and with their staff. So, you know, given that Lauren follows and, and has peer models in her in her SPARK program, she will have peer models who are going to be in class attending at, at class. And um, and so that may help her in that program. And, uh, and, uh, Mr. Plank, I would just like to say I I, I have empathy for your situation. Yeah. Um, and any of the students, or I should say any of the, the of our students in the um, YMCA, City of Morro Bay, or City of Slow uh, child care programs, we're working really hard to assign some of our willing um, staff members who um, might have, um, um, uh, might have a willingness to be a part of, of assisting in those programs to okay. guide students specifically. So um, we're working on that behind the scenes right now. In okay. fact, um, we have a meeting tomorrow, a cabinet meeting tomorrow to discuss, um, to discuss assignments for those particular employees in our organization that may not have clear duties now that we're on a distance learning model. So okay. we're gonna be working really closely um, on that particular issue to help families that um, that have um, your particular um, um, constraints, you know, working mm -hmm. families. So right. um, that's that's what we're working on right now as we speak. And I, I'm glad you asked that question and you shared that with me yeah. because I think um, you're not alone. And um, <laughs> and I just want you to know we're working on it. So just just to be clear on what I thought that I heard. Uh, so you're working on trying to have maybe a, a staff member or a teacher or some uh, support in person on site for each that of the is, locations and then be able to help train the uh, individuals. Uh, you know, the Sun and Fun staff were very clear on, you know, there's going to be, a, you know, the ratio isn't going to be very good. 
as far as, you know, and they're not trained teachers. They'll do the best they can to make sure the kids are on task, but they're, all they're, all they're going to know is that the kids are looking at the screen, basically. Yeah, and, and Mr. Plank, we're, what I'm trying to tell you is we do know the, um, the type of employees that are in the Sun and Fun programs and the YMCA right. programs. Um, and what we're trying to do is provide them with extra support so okay. they're not having to take on that role yes. um, as instructor. And right. so um, our goal is to provide support. Now I'm be being very careful knowing that this is a special education yes. forum, but I always like to land a little bit on the risky side here. But <laughs> I, I believe we can provide support for students um, to, um, in those settings during the instructional time frames um, mm -hmm. to really help keep kids focused, give them the help they need um, to the best of our abilities. And, um, and that way um, we can fine tune it depending on where the needs land um, and um, fine tune it uh, each week as we learn more and more about the needs of kids and um, and that's where Diane and Joyce can work with with um, the child care providers can work with our instructional support group um, the child's teachers and perhaps case managers to figure out a way to fine-tune their program and okay. uh, give them the help they need does that help you yes yes that's uh, you know if I think that would go a long way as you know provide some additional support and training for the you know their 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 caregivers are not instructors mm -hmm. that's essentially. Right. so and and uh, i'm I'm well aware of that, and I'm not going to expect them to turn into teachers uh, right. because we sent yeah. them an email um, <laughs> yeah yeah and 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 I want you to know that this is not a replacement for the teacher, it's not a replacement yeah. for the the para. But right. it is the middle ground that I'm trying to find here that right. that yeah. gives gives us half a fighting chance, right, to help um, mitigate some of the learning loss that might occur. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Thank you, and thanks, Mr. Plank. Hey, I just wanted to remind the group that this is being recorded, um, just for your understanding. And then um, if we've had any Spanish speakers join our group after the first 15 minutes, we do have translator available. You just have to go down to the bottom of your screen, hit participants, hit the globe, and you will make it to a Spanish translation. All right, Mandy or Luana, do we have another question? Yeah, you do, you have uh, Darla up next. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for this forum. And many of my questions were answered with the previous people, so that's good. Um, so uh, my child uh, goes to the high school and he's one of the at-risk vulnerable population students. Um, and the distance learning is just not going to work for him given his cognitive um, limitations at all. So I'm crossing my fingers for that waiver that's been discussed. I'm curious, um, as you look forward, are, are there discussions in looking back since March 16th as to the ground that is being lost? Um, any discussions around any compensatory education or you know, how will some of these kids be brought back to what they are, are missing as you all try to, and we all try to figure this out? Mm -hmm. So first of all, I, I guess I'd say um, we all have our fingers crossed. I will tell you that every member of cabinet, Joyce Hansen, um, across the board in this district, we want to bring our um, special needs kids back. We do. We think they um, need to have in-person instruction. And I forgive me if I sound like a, a broken record, but that's why we did ESY in person. Yeah. We knew these kids needed in-person instruction and San Luis Coastal did what very few districts did. We brought them back. Um, in terms of loss of progress, it's something that we're concerned about. Joyce and I talk about it a lot. Yeah. We talk about it with our IEP managers as well. Um, we really are trying to design distance learning plans that help our children maintain progress 
or progress a bit. We understand that we have very, very vulnerable children with really intense needs, but we still design their distance learning plans individually for each one of them. In terms of compensatory education, learning loss, that's kind of a one-on-one -on -one discussion. You are welcome to call your IEP manager. You're welcome to call um, either Joyce or me. And we can really analyze what's going on with your own kiddo. Like what did progress look like? What did um, access to the online learning look like? And we can have a discussion. And we probably have that discussion in an IEP meeting and try to come up with some data to show where we are with your own kiddo. But then I guess I would say one more time, if we can bring these kids in person, we are going to do it. So Darla, I think I answered your question. I'm not entirely sure that I hit all the points. You did. It's, it's uh, almost unanswerable at this point. And I just wanted to hear what the thoughts have been. Yeah, so I appreciate it. you got it. Next, you have Mabel Jer uh, Jeremio. Jeremio. Jeremio, okay. okay. This is Jeremio. Did you have a question? Mandy, do you want to take off her mute button? Yeah, I tried. So she still needs to unmute it on her end as well. Okay, I found my. There she very is. Very good, very good. I found me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am a service coordinator with San, um, a Tri -County. Tri County Center. And I have several families that a lot of the questions have been answered with the conversation we've been having. Um, they are children that absolutely need to have someone other than mom and dad because at this point they're really done with mom and dad being teachers mm -hmm. being mom and dad being everybody everything day in and day out and they're having anxiety attacks they're having aggressive issues uh, they're regressing in their behaviors how, what can we do? Are we, can we do something like the ESY for these few children that are really honestly regressed so badly that parents are at the week's end, they don't know what to do? Mm -hmm. Our hope is to do exactly what we did with ESY. That's absolutely our hope. We want to bring these kids back, but there are just a couple of hurdles that we have to um, have to take care of before we are legally able to bring these small groups back to campus. But like I said, it's our interest. We know that many, many of our children learn better on campuses with their highly trained teachers and paras, and that in the home, there's not quite the same um, understanding of the students' needs. We understand that's going on. But we also have to balance that with the health and safety of our staff, of our students, and of our parents. And right now, Cal you know, the California Department of Public Health is telling us you can't have them in person yet. So that's where we are right now. We are aggressively trying to bring kids back. We truly are. Could it be that some of these very, very few children be put in one campus and with the, all the precautions, the distance, the PPE? Because I'm pretty sure it's not like hundreds and hundreds of children yeah. that have this issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. And we would. Yeah, we would look at um, spreading our children out. This summer for our ESY, we mm -hmm. used 
six different campuses and we had 12 different classrooms. So picture two classrooms per campus. And those classrooms did not have more than seven or eight children in them. So we really kept the um, numbers down and we used the entire district. So it's exactly as you are describing. Use your resources, spread the children out, make sure you have all of the sanitation in place. And we did that. And honestly, our ESY is a model for anything right. we do when we're allowed. So yes. Okay, and that can be done also in uh, um, in the other district, in the other school district. Ugh, I can only speak for um, San Luis Coastal and what our intent is. Um, we do, though, work with our county schools. Dr. Prater works with the other superintendents. I work with the other directors. And I would say consistently across educators, we know there are children we have to bring back. So I don't think that San Luis Coastal is the only one looking at their most vulnerable kids. Awesome. Thank you for having this forum. This is mm -hmm. wonderful. Oh, you're welcome. I can't tell you how much I have learned. <laughs> Thank Great. You. Good. I'm glad you're here. Dr. Prater. I really appreciate, really appreciate this conversation. Mm -hmm. It's so important. And um, I, I, I think it's um, vital that you keep this conversation going, especially as we move forward. Um, that way we can refine what the needs are as we go. But in to, to the previous point, um, like I said, we're meeting with the county superintendents um, along with Dr. Bornstein this uh, Friday, and we're hoping to um, we're hoping to land on a, a more clear decision as to how we can bring our most vulnerable student population back in person because we do recognize the need. And I can speak, I think I can speak just from my direct experiences with the other county superintendents that um, we're all we're all concerned about um, this particular group of students. And we, we're trying really hard to figure out the best way to, to um, support the needs of our kids. So I can validate that for sure. Thank you. Yeah, some of the children that I am talking about, a couple of them, um, they are hurting themselves and hurting others. and. Mm -hmm sitting by the door every morning with their backpack, yeah. ready, waiting for the bus. And they mm -hmm. don't understand why the bus is not coming. Yeah. And why mm -hmm. is mom and dad always telling them it's not? Um, it's, it's a hard balancing act. It's mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. by now, my vacation is over and I, I need to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. right, right. And it's not the park and it's not the beach. I'm done with the park, I'm done with the beach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, we heard, yeah. yeah, we heard across the board from our ESY teachers that our students walked in the classrooms with the biggest smiles on their face. Yeah. We're yeah. so happy to be back, fell right into the same routines. It was really kind of beautiful. Joyce might be able to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, we, you know, we had students that we were definitely concerned about, you know, where they, what they were gonna be coming back and you know what you know what they were going to look like when they came back and they were overwhelmingly overjoyed to be there and sitting down at their desk knew their routine and were just looked so calm and comfortable and like this is where i belong and so it's just been it was wonderful to see that in esy and um we we can't wait to see that again yes so cannot wait <laughs> yeah thank you yeah, yeah. Thank you. i am super concerned very yes. very as are we yeah. Thank yeah. Sure. Thanks. I'm done. <laughs> Mandy, uh, next question. Yeah, next we have Kristen May. Hi, everybody. How's it? How you doing? Good. <laughs> good. Um, Happy to have I, you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. As a gen ed teacher, I can say I cannot wait to get back to students at some point. <laughs> Put me in, coach. Um, but I really am here as a parent today. I have uh, two young ones with IEPs in the PEEP program and in preschool. And uh, I do understand that the waiver is for TK through sixth graders. And Dr. Prater mentioned that 
perhaps there was a door open to getting students for over 12 years old. And I was just um, grasping for some hope that yeah. maybe that might also apply to our younger kiddos. Mm -hmm. I believe so. I, I don't believe that we would um, keep preschoolers from opportunities that we're able to um, provide for our K through adults. Um, we're really proud of our um, preschool special education program in this district, and we know that early intervention is critical. So given the opportunity, preschool will be part of our um, plea to bring special education children back. Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah Ms. Ms. May, I, I, uh, I um, left that part out. And that <laughs> the whole continuum is what we're concerned with. Great, thank you. Next we have Julie. <clears throat> Hi, thank you for the form. Um, my son, as you are probably aware, is one of those students who, for behavioral reasons and the intensity of his disability, uh, distant learning just didn't work, <laughs> mm -hmm. isn't going to work. And um, I'm just wondering what your expectations are for a kiddo like him for attendance and participation when when he tries to participate, there become behaviors, and uh, it's just it's just really difficult. Mm -hmm. What your expectations would be for him? He was one of the kids that attended ESY, and he was I could tell he was so happy to go back. Okay. Yeah, you know, we'll um, we'll design those expectations with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's the piece of the individual distance learning plan. Your IEP manager will contact you. If we are still not in person in small groups, you will sit down virtually and talk about what works for your kiddo until the day that we can bring him back to campus. Is it smaller sessions? Is it, like I said, phone versus video? Is it written instead of video? There's a, there's a lot of um, possibilities out there, but I think it takes a personal discussion. And Joyce, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. You have so much expertise with tech. Yeah, no, no, I think you, I was kind of had my mental checklist and you hit all my mental checklist on the points on that one that absolutely it's, it's an individual discussion and we have begun actually to have individual discussions with some parents already. Um, and, you know, that will be continuing and, you know, just trying to think strategically about what it's going to look like for students and then how we can support them and make it so it is accessible because you know, that is our goal in our distance learning is we need, you know, we want to make it as accessible as we can, um, given the, the unfortunately, the restraint of that it has to be distance learning at this point. Um, so that's where we are right now. And um, I just had a question for Dr. Prater. Will you let us know the outcome of your meeting with Penny Bornstein on Friday? Will you be able to yeah. do that? Yeah, I'm hopeful. Um, we have um, sometimes those those meetings we have. Um, what happens is we discuss it and we come to basic agreement, and then we bring it back to our um, our unique school boards and discuss those things because they are kind of local decisions by school boards. And so I can't speak because I haven't had the meeting yet. But um, what I can tell you is that our school board is um, is. Um, a, uh, I think a, they're a, war a group of warriors for what we're talking about here. And they're very much concerned with the same things we're, we're talking about here, what everyone's sharing. So um, I, as soon as I can um, speak to what we learned about the waivers, about the, the ability to carve out potential in-person uh, learning groups um, for our most vulnerable, populations, um, I'll be sure to let you know and let this group know right away. Okay, that's, uh, that's it for my questions. Thank you all for your time and effort and thank you for the forum and can't wait to get Robert back in school. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Julie. Next we have Jessica. Okay. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for your, um, doing the forum today. I am the parent of a boy that's going into seventh grade with an IEP. And spring of last year was um, a major challenge, as it was for everybody. Um, and both his dad and I work full time. And, um, you know, the success in this format, it seems like really relies on the kids having a degree of organizational skills, or at least at his level, um, organizational skills that are just not accessible. They're, it's not, doesn't work out. Um, and the only kind of effective or successful days he had were when somebody can really be there, you know, right by his side, sitting next to the screen and all of that. And with two parents who need to work full time, um, it's possible that, you know, we're trying to figure out our options, but it's possible he'll have to be home alone at some point mm -hmm. um, during the day. And so I'm wondering, and at his age, it doesn't sound like there are any options for him to go somewhere in person. Um, so I'm wondering, one, if, um, if that is accurate or if there are some options I'm not aware of, and two, um, your thoughts on support for students that really are not going to have the at-home support that is needed for them to be, to even be in the right, the right Zoom call at the right time, um, or to, you know, mm -hmm. log in when somebody is not sitting there at the exact minute saying log in, because even mm -hmm. a five-minute warning is not actually going to be successful, you know, it needs... Mm -hmm. Yeah, real time in the moment support. And so, um, yeah, and I know, I know options are limited for everybody, but um, yeah, I'm just wondering your thoughts on those things. In terms of the childcare, I'm not entirely sure with an incoming seventh grader to tell you the truth. I, there may be somebody else on the Zoom who has more understanding of what would be allowable. I would hope that a seventh or eighth grader might be able to join some of our child care options throughout. I do know that organization can be a struggle with our um, with some of our students, and it sounds like it's the same with your kiddo. Um, the um, ability to get online on his own, that kind of thing. Um, individual work with the IEP manager has been helpful last spring. We do have kids who wouldn't do it without prodding. Um, we have assigned paraeducators to mm -hmm. do that prodding, make a phone call. The parent has shared the child's um, cell phone number, that kind of thing. Um, sometimes we find out who the child does have a connection with on campus because most of our kids have a connection with someone and we have them make the phone call. We have them um, initiate the Zoom, something along those lines. So there are kind of a few um, strategies that we can use that might, we might be able to help your kiddo work on his or, well, his um, organization skills. Joyce, I see you wanting to add something there. So, um, yeah, I was just going to say that the, those kind of executive functioning organizational okay. skills are one of the things that we're, um, our program specialists are working on coming up with tips and suggestions and we'll be training staff on next week also um, kind of looking at that and doing more research on that and, and sharing more ideas on that um, because that is a that is a big struggle for a lot of our students is that organizational piece and how to maintain and how to keep track of what's going on when and where and and different strategies that we can use to help support that but again you know like diane said we've had paras that call students or text students or you know they're setting up a zoom and okay now we're going to go you know into this session and, and work on it that way with parents students so it is it's an individual and case-by-case -case basis on what the student needs and what's going to work for that student because while all, a lot of our students need organizational skill support, they all need <laughs> something that looks a little bit different because something a little bit different works for each of them. Dr. Prater. Yeah, and, and I would like to say um, to, to that, I have 
tremendous empathy for what you just said. Um, former middle school principal, middle school teacher, and I have a incoming seventh grader um, who's not particularly organized. So um, I, I have empathy, and one of the things that I will commit to is um, speaking with the Y as well as the city of Slow and Morro Bay about um, about see if we can offer um, some kind of um, some kind of system at the middle level. It may not be a daily um, child care kind of thing, but it might be a, a way to do focus groups at the middle level for kiddos that struggle with organization where there could be, you know, two to three days a week where we could offer something through the Y, through, um, through the cities that, um, that would allow for parents to have that option. And it might be enough just to keep um, our, our middle school kiddos on the, on the track you know, rolling down the track and without, um, you know, completely um, um, veering off. So I, I will work with um, Ryan Pinkerton and uh, he's my assistant suit for business. He's the one spearheading the child care uh, program. And I will um, add that to his uh, list. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That sounds like a really great option, Dr. Prater, or some some version of that. <laughs> Every little bit helps. And, yeah. you know, in working with his um, primary research teacher in sixth grade, the way it worked, it's still, you know, obviously a lot was still being worked out um, in the spring, but it still, him getting support relied on him going to her Zoom room at a certain time if he wanted support and explicitly asking for help with certain assignments, but if you know he didn't, he didn't feel like going in that day, or um, you know calling into the meeting, or he lost track of time, or he said nope, I'm all set, um, then that was the end of the conversation, and um, there was you know it was hard to get any kind of anybody holding helping him hold accountability for. Um, what's going on. So I think I, you'll, yeah, I think you'll see the accountability today is this, this, this fall, um, just given the increase in synchronous instruction, our teachers are going to be looking for their children on the screen. They're going to be taking attendance. So I think we'll have a little bit more accountability there. You might find yourself being contacted a little bit more. You know, your kiddo wasn't here on Tuesday. What can we do to get him here on Wednesday? That kind of thing. So we're really putting practices in place that will um, not only draw our kids in, but um, follow through when they are not in their sessions. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Well, thank right, you for thank your question. You, you got yeah, it. Thank you guys very much. Next, we have Robert Aaron. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the useful information. I um, Can you hear me okay? I can. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, great information. I share many of the concerns of, uh, that have been voiced by the parents so far. Um, my question really has to do with the coordination of synchronous general education and synchronous special education. Um, we have two sons, four and five years old. They participate in the PEEP program. Um, one will be attending preschool at Cuesta. The other will be attending kindergarten at uh, Pacheco. And so I'm just wondering, recognizing the importance of synchronous um, education and um, the contact that will aid in the socialization uh, of, of, you know, education at this moment, how will students be able to participate in both synchronous gen ed programs and synchronous special ed programs? Will they be synced such that one will not have to step out of gen ed in order to do special education? How do they, how do they best um, capitalize on, on both of these important experiences. 
So as a former resource specialist and elementary school principal, um, that is the age old question that we hear from parents, especially parents with you know, young children or ju children just starting in special ed is, you know, we don't want them to miss out on their general education instruction, but we want them to get the support. And uh, what I will say is that for our elementary resource specialists, they are the masters of a fluid schedule and they fluidly schedule you know their students to you know and they're looking at the you know the different lessons and the different times of lessons for all of the grade levels that they're working with and making sure that they're scheduling them because they don't want your child to be missing out on that gen ed instruction um, and they do not want they don't want their instruction to be detrimental they want their structure instruction to be supportive to your child and so it's it's just going to be a matter of them fine tuning it. They may think they have a schedule in place and then, you know, you'll work, you'll, you'll hit that schedule for a few days and then it won't work or that, you know, something will happen and the teacher's schedule will change. So they'll be in contact and they'll be working with the teachers closely and working with you also to make sure that your child is getting the, the specialized instruction that they need while also getting access to that general education instruction. Can I ask a follow up question then? You know, given the, um, the nine to 12, sorry, given the it's nine to, to 12. Getting yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of participants, more than the 57 participants in this meeting. Um, given the nine to 12 um, scheduling of uh, gen ed this fall, will there be opportunities then to use the afternoon for some special ed uh, instruction? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, absolutely. Great, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, next, we have someone, uh, don't have a name, it's TC. It's Seneca. It's Tri Counties. I got to work on that. Sorry. I don't <laughs> that yet. Um, this has been really helpful, and I, I really applaud the district for hustling <laughs> with an unprecedented situation. It's, 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 I'm really impressed. Um, I got very excited when Dr. Prater was talking about the Spark program, went and Googled it, noticed there's a wait list. So, um, yeah. Uh, Dr. Prater, as you go to go to bat with the powers that be, uh, I don't know if uh, opening up that program anymore uh, might be possible because that, it could really be something that could help uh, the working families. Um, so that's, um, yeah, that was that was it. And then also just financially for families, uh, working families um, who have to pay uh, for childcare. I, I think Joyce, I know I emailed you just. Mm -hmm. What do families do? Who do they call? And you mentioned uh, for them to contact the Family Resource Center with San Luis Coast. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. You know, any resources for that would be appreciated knowing about. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate that. The more, the more I roll up my sleeves and, and figure out the, the most appropriate path forward, you know, I keep coming back to this child care component for working families yeah. or for, you know, or for families that really are in a, a tough, a tough place with their own child. And, and, you mm -hmm. know, there are a number of those uh, families as well. So what I can tell you is I did check in just yesterday uh, to find out what um, the status of the child care waiting list was. And um, Mr. Pinkerton informed me that yes, there were, there, there is a waiting list, However, um, they're still trying to um, figure out the, um, the, uh, how they're going to utilize the assigned classroom spaces for those particular rooms. And, um, and that I've been assured that we're going to revisit um, expanding those spaces um, so that families that really need it going to have it um, to the best of our abilities. Now, what's, what's tricky on the childcare side is um, finding enough staffing. And, um, and so next Tuesday, one of the board agenda items that we will put up on for discussion will be this very topic. Okay. And, um, and I'm trying, well, let me just say it this way. We're trying really hard as a district uh, to partner with um, the city of Slow the Wines Day and the City of Morro Bay, and they are terrific partners. 
And so we're working on finding a formula so that, um, so that they um, can pay their employees, but not necessarily make, make money off it. And that we then as a district can figure out a way to minimize the impact on families. Yeah. Um, the cost burden and so forth. Yeah. So we're really wrestling with this topic. I can tell you that, that I think we've come to a really, I think, a good um, place where I think um, we can come to a, a reasonable solution to support our families and, um, and try to make sure, try our best to make sure that we have enough spots for kids. So um, that's really appreciated. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's excellent. And, and of course, there will be some children who for um, uh, behavioral or communication or toileting needs um, wouldn't be able to participate in that program without a one on one support. Yeah, it, it gets complicated really yep. quickly. Yep. But, um, <laughs> but what I will say to you is I'm, I'm an optimistic uh, person. And I think this challenge can be overcome. I really do. I think we have some fantastic uh, partners and a board that really supports this effort. So we, we'll find a way to figure it out. It may not, <laughs> we might, we might uh, bounce a few times off the cement, but um, I think we'll end up within, within short order, we'll end up figuring this out. Excellent. Well, well thank you so much. And uh, thank you for your question, Seneca. Okay. All right. I know we're coming up on 430. Mandy, do we have how many questions no do we have in the queue? We have, we have no more questions. Oh my gosh, that was perfect timing. <laughs> I can't believe it. Uh, well, I really do want to thank everybody yeah. for being here today. Your questions were just really right on point and I think helped everybody in the room. Um, we are audio and video recording. Um, Mandy and Luana have been actually taking list of all the questions so that we can um, write down our answers and make them available to um, other families with questions. Um, Joyce and I are always available yeah. for email questions and we will get back to you and have phone conversations about your own particular child, your own particular circumstances, but also know in about a week's time, maybe a week and a half, you're also going to be hearing from your child's IEP manager so that we can really individualize those services for the fall. Yeah. Joyce, any last thoughts? Um, we had also said that we were, were, were talking about planning some informational sessions for yeah. families coming up this fall, um, specifically kind of looking at, you know, kind of tips and resources for preschool parents, um, maybe some, you know, like a K-12 kind of tips and resources for working with students at home and, and then just um, another session, perhaps we had a session last spring with Mitch Taubman and we're looking at also bringing him back for another parent session also um, for tips for working at home with a student. So just, and well, thank, thank you, you all, all for being very here. very much. Yeah. <laughs> really appreciated your time this afternoon. Yeah. Thank you all. And thank you guys. Thank you. We appreciate okay, thank that. you.